to the Lord in his word. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I have a long way to go and a short time to get there, so you just got to bear with me. Is it okay if I come down here in what I would call baptismal range? You'll figure that out in a minute in the first row, Will. Most of the time after I minister the first time, people don't sit in the front row anymore. They sit on the second row. But my brother here, you're awesome. In Genesis chapter 3, I really feel like this kind of gives us a blueprint of how the enemy comes against us. Now, I want to kind of set this up before I get into into the, the chapter here. There are two predominant ways that the enemy comes against us, or two categories that he comes against us. And the reason that I've titled this message, Unmasking Satan, is because he is always masquerading as someone powerful. Hence, he masquerades as someone powerful. You could even look in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, where it says he roars around like a lion. The Bible doesn't say he is a lion. The Bible says he roars around like a lion. In other words, he is masquerading as someone that he is not. And so the reason that I have titled this message, Unmasking Satan, because I really want to show you this afternoon just how defeated he really is in relation to who you are. I want you to consider this thought. Satan is victim to your victory. He is already in the defeated position. You are already in the position of victory. Therefore, you come from that reality of victorious victory in Christ, freedom in Christ. Amen. And so what the enemy is going to try to do is to convince you that he is the one that's in the victorious position and you are the one that's in the defeated position. And the way that he does that is really in two particular categories. And you find it in Genesis chapter 3, gives us the blueprint of it. And that is deception and temptation. I want you to write those two things down. Deception and temptation. The power of deception is the ignorance of truth. I want you to think about what I just said. The power of deception is simply the ignorance of truth. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, what? You shall know the truth and the truth shall. So by that context, the truth you don't know is what's keeping you bound. All bondage is a byproduct of a lie believed. And what gives a lie an avenue or a place in your heart is ignorance. I thought I would get at least one or two amens by now. I guess you guys are just thinking. I'd much rather you think and apply rather than sh- shout, scream, and holler and not hear what I say. The power of deception is the ignorance of truth. And so it gives the voice of a liar purpose in your heart is that ignorance. In other words, truth silences the voice of the liar. And so when you fill your heart with the word and when you fill your heart with truth, you become divinely equipped to destroy or to silence every voice or every voice of a liar that's coming against you. You see, when I grew up an atheist, and I shared my story with you a little bit uh, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I want, but I want to develop that a little bit more, because I don't want you to think I just had that encounter, and then everything simply just worked out from that standpoint. There was also another thing that I did that you, that you need to have a foundation of, and that was I built a structure of God's word in which the encounter can now fit within that context. Because if you don't have a biblical foundation in your heart, it doesn't matter how many encounters that you have, but what happened is that your mindset will take you back into what the encounter took you out of. And so once I had Jesus appear to me, and that's how I got saved. Man, isn't that good? <laughs> like Jesus appeared to me, that's how I got saved. But you will think, man, that would just be enough to keep me free. The truth that sets you free is also the truth that will keep you free when you continue in it. 
So I met the person in Jesus. He sets me free. Three days after I get out of the hospital, my, I'm at my father's house. And at this time, my father and I, I hadn't told anybody that I had this encounter with this man because I had enough wisdom on me. They're already trying to send me to a mental place anyway. So I didn't tell the doctors that a man appeared to me. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't telling anybody that. I mean, I am just letting them all just think, man, what happened to this guy? And so my dad and I, we are not even having a conversation about the man that appeared to me. I don't even know that he is a Christian at this point, which he got saved the month before. I didn't even know that. And so we get to his house, and after two, three, four days go by, I realize I'm not even going through any withdrawals from the drugs. Like, I'm completely set free from, from the drugs, well, my cousin comes over. Uh, I haven't seen my family in probably eight or nine years at that point. My cousin comes over, and we're just hanging out on the couch, and we're just getting to kind of catch up with one another. And all of a sudden, I start speaking in different languages to it. I'm speaking in tongues. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I was a Christian yet because I was an atheist. I had never even been to church. I didn't know I was a Christian. And so all of a sudden, I start speaking in different languages to my cousin, and my cousin is one of these people that carries mace on, mace on his keychain. And so he pulls his mace out like this. And I'm looking at my cousin, and I'm like, I'm trying to tell him to call 911. I'm like, And he's trying to spread me with a mace. He's like, ah! I mean, this, like, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this goes on for five minutes. Why well, can't even speak American? You know, we don't speak English. <laughs> and after about five minutes, I finally get where I can speak again, where I can talk again. And he was like, what in the world was that? I said, well, I met a man. He said, what you mean you met a man? <laughs> like that. I said, no, not like that, brother. I said, no, when I was in the hospital room, this, this man appeared to me. He said his name was Jesus. This is what happened to me. And he, and he says, oh, sounds like you're a Christian. I said, really? I said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, uh, what, what that means is now you need to learn how to be what a Christian does, to be a Christian. I said, so what do I need to do? He says, you need to go to Walmart. <laughs> Yeah, everything you need in your life is at Walmart. <laughs> Anybody bear witness with that? <laughs> I said, so why, why do I need to go to Walmart? He says, well, there's a black book there that you need to buy. He says, in this black book, it has gold letters written on it. It says, Holy Bible. You need to buy this book. You need to read this book. And you need to apply this book to your life. Here's the key point. That was the best advice I've ever received in my life. He says, you need to get this book. So that's what I do. I go to Walmart. He explained it to me. He says, it's black. He says, don't get the red one. Now, I don't know why he told me that. You're not going to hell if you have a red Bible. <laughs> I'm just, the only thing I know is he told me, he described it to me. Look, you get a black book, gold letters. I'm like, okay, nobody's going to pull the wool over my eyes, right? And so I go to Walmart. I go over to the book section, you know, and there it is. I find the black book. I get it, gold letters. Okay, I get home and I open it up and it's in Shakespeare. <laughs> you know, the King James first. In Alabama, you don't talk like that. I mean, I, 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 here I'm trying to read the book, and I'm like, whoa, we, yeah, whoa, whoa. I'm like, man, I can't read this stuff. I like the dude at the hospital didn't show up saying, oh, brother, where art thou? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you guys some of this stuff. And so what I do, I go back to Walmart and I get another version or translation I can understand, you know, the NIV one, the not inspired one. And I, and I grab that one and I come all the way back home and I open this book up and you know what happens? In the very first chapter, I, and all of a sudden I'm reading the scripture and all of a sudden I'm pulled into this story. Oh. 
the story of a good God that makes man formed out of his good image to be a good steward of his good creation. And right there in first, very first chapter, I see value. I see identity. I see purpose. I see existence. Why I am created to be in divine fellowship. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm pulled back into this experience that I had at the hospital room. And I'm pulled into the story of redemption, the story of creation, the story of justice. And I get all the way to the end of this book, and it takes me about 35 days to read the whole Bible because I thought Christians were supposed to read the Bible. I didn't know you weren't supposed to read it. And so I got all the way to the end of the book, you know, and in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, do not forsake the assembling. And to give you some context of my, my history here, I grew up in Alabama, and one, of, and one of the reasons I was an atheist is because there was a church on every corner. But every church was always the same. It was always a white building. It had a cemetery behind it, so I thought they were all funeral homes. <laughs> and you always saw old people going in there, and they didn't come out. <laughs> you saw where they went. And I was like, man, I am never stepping in that sucker. I mean, even today, I, I go to some churches, they already got buzzards flying around the steeple when I pull into the park. Anyway, somebody will get that next week. <laughs> and so I read in Hebrews 10, it says, do not forsake the assembling. So I feel like, well, well, I need to go find a church. I need to find a community to go to. And so that's what I started doing. I started going to find a, a church in my uh, community. I asked my father, and we finally started having a conversation about Christ and about Christianity. And he said, well, I just started attending this vineyard church. Well, you go check this vineyard church out. I said, okay. And so I pulled in uh, that Sunday morning. It was a dirt parking lot, and there was a Christian uh, standing out by his car smoking a cigarette because that's what Christians do. And, and so I, I pull in. And I get out, and I never had a conversation with a Christian at this point. So I never, I didn't know what it was going was to be like. And so I get out in Alabama, you always say, well, tell me your story, brother. And so that's what he says to me. But I didn't know not to tell him my story. <laughs> and so I start telling him my story, and it seems like he's dying a thousand deaths in front of me. He's turning as white as my shirt, and he looks at me in my first conversation with a Christian he says this, after he heals my experience, he says, there's no way that can be God. And in that moment, I realized most Christians don't know Christ. And I looked at him, I said, well, who was I working for before then? I says, well, who, who was I serving when I was robbing and stealing and doing drugs? I said, who was that? He said, he kind of got a good point there. I realized later he wasn't like a normal church attendee. He was only there because his wife drug him to church, and he's out there nervous because he's in the parking lot, and those demons stirred up, you know. He didn't want to go in there. He's like, <laughs> So I had this conversation, but thankfully, I knew I needed to get inside this building. And so I go inside of this building. I open the door, and there's people. They're worshiping. They're singing. And all of a sudden, that same presence it was in my hospital room that I found in the scriptures. It was right there in this community of, community of believers. And i oh, this is my people. This is where I belong is right here in this place around my family. See, the most beautiful thing about being a Christian is that no matter where you go in the world, you can always find family because we, oh. At the end of the service, pastor comes up to me and says, well, tell me your story. <laughs> and based on my last experience, I didn't know if I should tell him my story or not. But I did. And this is what he says to me. He says, you have been sovereignly chosen by God. He says, I affirm. He says, I want you to start coming here because I want to pour my life into you. I want to help disciple you in the word. He was also an ex-Navy SEAL. So that's why I'm intense, brother. Because he will kill you quick. (laughs) 
And I started meeting with them about once a week, and they would just teach me the Bible, and we would go over different things in the Gospels, and like halfway through Bible study, I would get out and get out and walk out the building. He was like, William, where are you going? I said, well, I thought we were supposed to go out and do this stuff. <laughs> I said, am I just supposed to sit here and listen to you talk about it? He's like, I, I like you, William. And over the course of about six years, they're discipling me. And during that time, my my father, which is a man of God, by the way, I love my father. He's a man that whatever he tells you he's going to do, he's going to do it. And he told me he was going to help me buy a home. And so what, what he did, he helped me buy this mobile home. Now, this mobile home, we paid $4,500 for it to give you some idea of his living condition. And so I'm moving to this house, and when I'm moving to this house, I dedicate my home unto the Lord. And I said, Lord, this is a place that I'm going to only worship you in this house. This is a place I dedicate unto you, and the only thing I'm going to do in here is I'm going to study your word, I'm going to worship, and I'm going to fellowship with your, with your spirit. You see, it's time that we reclaim the spiritual condition or environment of our homes. One of the reasons we cannot minister to the nations is because our house is in trauma. And so I move into this house, I dedicate it unto the Lord, and the second night of being in there, demonic manifestations started happening. It was almost like the enemy could see my identity, see my destiny. It's like, well, I, I, need to try to, I need to try to kill this word before it germinates in his life. And all of a sudden, for almost a year, being in this, is, listen, I'm just being real with you, but I'm going somewhere with this. For almost a year, during the day, I'm studying the Word of God. I'm trying to get it inside of my heart. I'm trying to learn how to cooperate with it. But every night at 3 o'clock in the morning, a dark cloud would form in in my bedroom. It would come and hover over me, and then paralysis would start at my feet, work its way all the way up to my head to the point where I couldn't even move. And I would work very hard to just speak the name Jesus, but as soon as I would speak the name Jesus, it would lift. And then the next night it would happen all over again. And after about a year of just getting the word of God inside of me, I finally got this righteous anger. And listen, you need to get this inside of you again, listen, tonight or today. You need to have this righteous anger, vindication rise up inside of you and say, you know what, I'm not going to tolerate what I've been tolerating up to this point. Because I am not a victim, I am a victor. So I don't want you to think that all of this stuff just worked out magically. This goes on for a year. And finally, I just get fed up with it. I get mad. I've been studying the word. And I've just been getting it inside of me. I said, I've got to start learning how to use this as my weapon of warfare. And so that night, I felt like the Lord told me, he says, William, tonight, don't go to sleep. I want you to stay up. And when that cloud forms in your room, I'm going to show you what to do. And so that's exactly what happens. The cloud starts forming about 3 o'clock in the morning because it happened every night at 3 o'clock in the morning. This cloud starts forming. And this time, the Lord says, William, I want you to go into your kitchen, grab a chair, walk into your bedroom, set this chair in front of the, the, the cloud and tell the devil to sit in the chair and watch you worship Jesus. <laughs> you see, at that point, I, listen, I got fed up with allowing the devil to come torment me. Listen, the devil isn't here to torment you. You're here to torment the devil. And so until you realize that, you're going to be put yourself in a defeated position. And so that's what I did. I went into my kitchen. I grabbed this chair and set it right in front of this cloud. I said, you're going to sit here and watch me worship Jesus. And then I did this. I turned my back to the demonic. Do you know what I was doing? I was breaking the agreement that I was giving to the demonic by, by focusing on the enemy. In other words, what gives Satan's presence purpose is the attention in which you give him.
And as soon as I turn my back on the demonic and I just begin to worship Jesus, I begin to magnify Jesus, and I just begin to declare into the atmosphere the truth of who he is, and I will just lift him up and say, Lord Jesus, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the Redeemer. You are the Healer. You are the one that's died to set me free. You are the one that has inhabited me by your spirit. You are the one that's placed me as a victor. You are the one this purchased me by your blood. And I did this for like 10 minutes and I turned around and the cloud had formed into a, a, a person. It was a demonic person. It was laying in the floor in fear. And I realized this is the normal posture of the demonic in relation to me, fear of me realizing who I am in Christ. Woo. Now, I know this story is a little bit out there for some of you because we think all the demons are in another country. <laughs> I hate to tell you, I mean, there's a lot of demons that shake the pastor's hand when he walks out the door and says, hey, that was a good sermon, pastor. That didn't make me uncomfortable at all. Somebody. <laughs> oh, Lord. Let me try this side. They didn't quite get it. <laughs> you know what happened that night? That demon, I commanded him, I says, now you leave my house and you never come back again. Amen. That demon got up, he left out of my house, and guess what? I've never had a demonic attack like that again. Amen. And now it's been 17 years. Amen. Immediately. You know what I was doing? The whole time I was getting the word of God inside of me, I didn't realize it. You know what it was doing? It was germinating. It was strengthening me. It was. I was pulling out my weapon of warfare without even me even realizing it. You see, you need to start planting the truth inside of your heart and keep planting that truth inside of your heart. You may not see the fruit of it right now. It may be a week, it may be a month, it may be a year, it may be 10 years, but I'm telling you, if you continue to plant that word in your heart, it will germinate. And when that word of truth comes up, because it flows through the avenue of your voice, In the next six years, you know, I did for 12 hours a day. I went to work. I got off work at 5 o'clock. I would come back home. I would open up the scriptures and I would just, I got to know my God. You know what I was doing? That, that, this home became my seminary for six years. I didn't have a TV, didn't have a cell phone. I just got, the, got in the word of God. You know what it was doing? It was creating this biblical foundational structure that gave me the ability to now steward the encounter that I had with him. You know what I did? You know what I realized? That all the bondages, all the, the lies, all the false images, all the false beliefs I had my, about myself, I didn't overcome them by trying to find out every lie I believed. I overcame them by identifying truth. You see, introspection is a counterfeit role to the Holy Spirit. You see, when you get truth inside of your heart by default, every lie and every false belief you have ever had about yourself begins to be broken off. You see, there's two understandings you need about your salvation. The first one is this, what I've been redeemed from, that's my history. But the second one is the most important, what I've been redeemed to, that's my destiny. I want you to picture there's a cross up here. The, there's a cross right here. Me coming to the cross and being crucified is me, my history being dealt with. But me stepping through the cross into the resurrection is dealing with my destiny. What happens is most Christians only have one revelation, what they've been redeemed from. The issue is their belief system doesn't transition with their deliverance. In other words, they still view themselves through the lens of their history. 
All right. When you still view yourself through the lens of your history, you can only become a cleaned up version of who you used to be. You may not be doing meth anymore, but you're still probably drinking two pots of coffee every, every day. Drug addict. I'm kidding, kind of. But are you, are you seeing me? Like, like, I came out of drugs and alcohol. Like, I, and, and I know when I'm around somebody that's actually been set free because those addictive personalities and tendencies are no longer part of their identity. But if I meet someone that's a Christian that still have these addictive personalities, I understand they still view themselves through the lens of their history and not through the lens of their destiny. So therefore, what they came out of is still limiting what they can walk into. In other words, they're trying to have a new creation experience with an old creation belief system. You know what the Lord told me to do? He says, William, I want you to learn how to get this truth inside of you, and this is how I want you to do it. I want you to go and look in the mirror, and I want you to preach truth to yourself. I thought this was going to last like two days, three days, four days, five days. It lasted for a year. It was the most awkward thing I ever did in my life was preach to myself in the mirror. But you, but you know what? It changed me. I remember the Lord told me, he says, William, I want you to, uh, to find every passage of Scripture in the Bible that deals with your identity, and I want you to look in the mirror, and I want you to speak that truth to you. And I remember the first passage I started with was 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to become sin on my behalf so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I remember the first day that I looked into the mirror, at the very moment I would get to where I was declaring the truth of me being righteous, I would break eye contact with myself and I realized I don't believe it yet. And so I would sit there day in and day out for four or five minutes. I didn't do this long. Those four or five minutes. Day in and day out, and I would speak truth to myself, and I would force myself to look eyeball to eyeball with truth. At the end of the year, all of a sudden, my whole life was so transformed, and the Holy Spirit told me this. He says, William, the reason I needed you to look into the mirror and to declare truth is because I needed you to see the reflection of that truth in you. He says, because any truth that doesn't minister to you would never become a ministry through you. And I'm just speaking the word of God to myself. I'm speaking truth to myself. This is actually how I learned how to preach. I didn't learn how to preach by watch, watching the minister minister. I learned how to preach by preaching to myself. Do you know how many times I've led myself to Jesus? <laughs> Man, I mean, the anointing will fall on me looking at myself, preaching to myself. Like, yeah, I need Jesus in my life. I mean, I would practice the altar call on me. I mean, you could ask my wife now. I mean, if I wake up, if I, if I wake up on the wrong side of the bed, I still, I'll go look in the mirror and say, William, you need to get yourself right in Jesus' name. Some of you need to learn how to preach to you. Listen, the only person you will never escape from is you, so you better learn how to live with you. I had a, when I was an associate pastor, I had this guy come up to me and says, William, I know what I need to do. I need to go to a different church. He says, not only that, I probably need to go to a different city. I need to go to a different state. I said, there's one problem with what you're saying. He said, what's that? I said, well, you are going to take you everywhere you go. <laughs> so that means every problem you have now is going to manifest itself everywhere that you go because you have to deal with the greatest idol in your life, self. <laughs> Do you know that the devil is not the greatest threat to your destiny? You are. And so I'm living in this house, and over the years, the, I had a neighbor that moved in beside me, and it was a, a young lady with a little girl. And one day, they walk over, they knock on my door, and, they, and I answer the door, and it's this little kid. She has a brown box in her hand, and she's like, I want to, to welcome, uh, uh, we want to uh, acknowledge who we are. We're moving in beside you, and we want to give you a housewarming gift. 
So, okay, yeah, yeah. So I grabbed a little box. I talked to him for a few minutes. I walk in. I open up the box, and it's this little bitty black kitten in the box. <laughs> Does it look like I like kittens? Like, I'm from Alabama. I want bulldogs. I want Dobermans. And so I'm like, why did this girl give me a cat? But, you know, but I couldn't get rid of the cat because I know that girl's going to ask me about that cat next time I see that girl. <laughs> and so now I'm stuck with this cat. It needs Jesus. <laughs> and sure enough, I bring this cat in. This cat was completely black, and so I named this cat Cookie. I was like, Cookie, because I like chocolate chip cookies. Now sugar-free, but anyway. And so, and, and so I, I named this cat Cookie, and one day I'm sitting there preaching to myself in the mirror, and I noticed that this cat came in and started listening to me. <laughs> now, keep in mind, I never preached to anybody but myself at this point. Some of you think, man, he's getting off now. <laughs> you see, some of you want the door of opportunity to open, but you don't prepare yourself to walk through the door of opportunity. I didn't realize what I was doing. I was preparing myself for everything that God wanted to do in my life. But I first had to address the greatest enemy, me. William, I can't do what you're doing. I'm a pre introvert. So when, so when did your personality have the authority to define your destiny? And so I'm preaching to myself in this mirror, and all of a sudden this cat sitting there, and it's, li and it's literally it's listening to me. And I'm thinking, man, the cat's listening to me. And then I had this inspired thought. I said, you know what? I'm going to start practicing the altar call on the cat. <laughs> Some of you think I'm crazy. <laughs> so day after day, I, I began to preach myself to, to myself in the mirror. The cat would come in, start listening to me, and I look over at Cookie, and I say, "Now, Cookie, now do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior?" <laughs> the cat look at me crazy. I mean, this goes on for weeks. And I'm thinking, well, well, Romans chapter 8 says, for all of creation is awaiting for the revealing of the sons of God, so the creation itself can be set free from its slavery into the freedom of the glorious children of God. Oh, yeah, I'm going to preach to the cat. <laughs> now, don't go create some weird, anyway, whatever. I'm just telling you what I did. And so I have week, day after day, week after week, I'm preaching. The cat comes in, listens to me, and, and, and sure enough, I turn over, and I finally get to this place with this cat, and I'm like looking at Cookie. I said, now, Cookie, now do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And this cat was, listen, no joke. This cat looks at me and says, meow. I'm like, oh, my God, I led my cat to Jesus. <laughs> now, I don't go around preaching to animals, but you know what the Lord was doing? He was preparing me for my calling. <laughs> well, that's an interesting way to be prepared. You know what it was doing? It was building confidence in my heart. It was building strength in my heart. I was getting truth inside of me. My weapon of warfare, I'm, I'm just... I'm just living in victory, living in freedom. Listen, it doesn't have to be some long, drawn-out process. It takes you 35,000 years to get free. It can be one-step Jesus. You see, deception lives where ignorance, no, deception dwells where ignorance lives. And the lies of the enemy is coming against your mind, coming against your heart, because truth isn't there as a protector. And the more I got inside of his word, the more the truth that was filling my heart silenced the voice of the liar that came against me. Satan is only interested in people he can influence, and when he knocks on the door of your heart, will he find a place to influence Is this making sense? Man, I have 20 minutes. I haven't even made a point yet. <laughs> the second category that the enemy comes against you with is temptation. 
For example, the way the enemy tempts you is by projecting his own nature upon you, hoping that you will come in agreement with it. In other words, when a spirit of fear comes against you, the reason you experience fear is because the spirit itself is afraid. It's literally seeking your partnership so that its existence becomes your existence. So that its nature becomes your nature. In Galatians chapter 5, he gives a description of, fruit, of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is descriptive of your internal state of being. So whenever I have an emotion that contradicts the fruit of the Spirit, I do not grant it access to become my state of being. I let the fruits of the Spirit govern my internal state of being. And so when anything that comes against me that contradicts those fruits, I deny it access into my heart. Well, William, you just live in denial. Absolutely. Every time the devil says something, I deny what he says. Every time the enemy projects something on me, I deny what that experience is. So keep these two categories in mind. Now let's look, oh, 20 minutes. Now let's look in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are perfect in every aspect of the way. They're made in the image of God. They don't have a sin nature. They are totally and completely victorious. So how can the enemy bring them into defeat? The same way that he tries to do it today. He, listen, Satan is not a creator. He's a repeater. <laughs> In other words, he's a counterfeiter. He cannot create. He just simply manipulates what God has created. And so he comes against Adam and Eve right here. In Genesis chapter 3, let's look at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree from the garden. There's two things I want you to note here. The first thing it says that he is crafty. In other words, Satan is a master at creating illusions, false realities that have no substance to it unless you come into agreement with it. He's a master illusionist. He, he masquerades as someone powerful. Young David understood this when he saw Goliath. He didn't see Goliath as someone that was powerful. He saw Goliath as someone masquerading as someone powerful because he understood that the God of Israel that he represented. Oh. You see, understanding the Jesus within will redefine the purpose of the Goliath without. Now you no longer look at them as stumbling blocks but stepping stones. Now you understand the opposition that comes against you reveals the level of promise God wants to bring you into. And Satan is just trying to, to intimidate you, to deceive you, to tempt you, to, to thwart the destiny that God already has on your life. And so Satan comes with these false narratives, these illusions that have no reality until you agree with it. And then your agreement makes a false reality a reality in your heart. The most difficult prison to escape is the one created within the mind. And the second thing that he does right here is that he asks a question that directly undermines the command of God. Well, how does he do that in our life today? I would like to suggest to you that the most predominant way that, that the enemy undermines the authority of God's word in our life is by getting us to look to the facts of life instead of the truth of God's promise. How many of us know every truth is a fact, but not every fact is a truth? It may be true that you have a sickness, but truth says, by his wounds you are healed. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be factual or are you going to be truthful? Are you going to allow the facts of your life to determine your destiny or are you going to allow the truth of God's promise to determine your destiny? 
But Satan would do this in a way where it appears he is the one telling you the truth and God is the one lying because he waits until there's a sickness and say, did God really say? You see, in that moment, it appears as if he's the one telling you the truth and God is the liar. You see, Satan will say things that are true, but it's stripped of all its truth. I could tell you guys are thinking. <laughs> to illustrate this point, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at a story of a man named uh, Zechariah and a woman named Elizabeth, which is a father and mother of John the Baptist. Now, let me ask you this. If you had an a angel appear to you tonight and to give you a prophetic word, would you believe it? Let me rephrase that. And you know it's from God. <laughs> Would you believe it? Well, let's see how Zechariah handles his angelic visitation. Luke chapter 1 verse 11 says this. An angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard. In other words, the angel has come in response to his prayer, right? Now pay attention. The response that Gabriel or the angel is given to this petition is a prophetic decree over Zechariah's life. Now, listen to the prophetic word and then his response to the prophetic word. The angel goes on to say this, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Does he say she might? Listen to the language. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. Isn't that an amazing prophetic word? If I heard that prophetic word, if an angel appeared to me tonight and gave me a prophetic word like this, I would not have responded the way Zechariah responded. He says this, how will I know this is for certain? I'm like, you religious tard. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm thinking, what, what do you mean how am I going to know this is for certain? You have an angel standing in front of you. But listen to what Zechariah says at this point. Now he tells the angel why the word cannot happen. And he says this, for I am an old man and my wife is advancing years. What is he doing? He is taking the facts of his life and prophesying to the truth of his promise. He is looking at the truth of the promise and, and he's processing it through the facts of his life and he comes to this conclusion, there's no possible way that that promise can be true because I have all these things in my life pointing in the opposite direction and so he allows the facts to prophesy to his promise. Do you get that? I could tell this is hitting home. I've had to let the word of God determine my identity, to determine my value, determine my purpose, because I have many things in my life, many circumstances and many situations and many people that will constantly point me back to my history and not to my destiny. But you know what the word of God, the word of promise is always done. The word of God's promise always calls you from the future into the future. But the voice of Satan calls you from the past into the past. You need to stop allowing the pe people's opinion to become the authority of God's voice in your heart. And so he says this to, 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 the, to the angel, and the angel kind of gets frustrated, I believe, to the point where he has to justify his own existence. And the angel said this. 
The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak this the good news to you, you idiot. That's exactly what Gabriel does. Let's listen to like He said, I'm Gabriel. I come from the presence of God. <laughs> he has to justify his own existence. Like, do you read the Bible? Do you know who I am? Now listen to what Gabriel has to do in order for the promise to come about. And then he goes on to say this. Behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day which these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time. And so now Gabriel, because of Zechariah's response to his promise, to the word of truth that he's trying to give him, because of his response, what Gabriel does is he shuts his mouth for the duration of time so that the promise could actually be birthed through his life. In other words, if Zechariah could have talked for the duration of nine months, his words would have aborted his promise. And a lot of us wonder why we walk around sick, why we walk around defeated, why we walk around depressed, why we walk around beat up, why we walk around. Why? Because we are constantly speaking things that undermine the truth of our promise, not realizing that life and death is in the power of the tongue and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. We don't realize a lot of times we prophesy our own problems and then walk into the existence of them. I've just now started preaching. I've been told every reason under the sun why I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I used to have religious people come put their arm around me and say, William, I know you're excited about God, but give it four years, you'll be depressed like I am. You see, religious people always project their bondage on your freedom. Yeah. William, I know what you used to do. I'm like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never done that before. Like, yeah, yeah, you did. I saw you. Well, what do you what do you mean? I don't associate myself with who I was before the cross because my mindset is transitioned with my deliverance. So therefore, my thinking doesn't take me back into what God delivered me out of. And so therefore, I'm no longer going to associate myself with who I was before the cross because the person you see right here has never done drugs before. The person you see right here has never been an alcoholic. The person you see right here is completely and totally free. This person right here has been redeemed and sanctified. This person right here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I've started doing in my life? I started taking the truth of God's promise and prophesying to my circumstance instead of allowing the circumstance to prophesy to the truth of my promise. And so I don't go to God with my problem. I go to my problem with my God and I tell my problem, you be thou removed. Ooh. Are you going to be factual or are you going to be truthful? Are you going to allow the facts of your life to determine the level of destiny you can walk in? Or are you going to allow the truth of what God's word says about you? Become the prophetic voice that governs you. Yeah. And so he learns a valuable lesson right here. He learns that sometimes our silence carries more authority than our voice. Because if you cannot say something in faith, it is better for you to be silent 
Because in that situation, your silence will carry more authority than your voice because what we realize in this story is that the truth of God's promise has the power and ability within itself to accomplish its own purpose. And all I have to do is attach and align myself to it. And if I cannot speak its truth or speak its purpose, it is better for me to be silent because I know that word is still at work and I know that word is going to carry me through into the promise if I uh, close my mouth and not speak family this is this is the truth of God's word this is what he's done in your life Walking in victory is a lot easier than what you think it is. You need to stop tolerating what you've been tolerating in your life and in your heart. Jesus loves you so much, he's willing to make you his home. Verse 2 in Genesis 3. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the tr fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall eat from it or touch it or you will die. The first mistake that she makes is having a conversation with a deceiver. The second mistake that she makes is adding to what God declared. Because you see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, what God really said was this, but from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from it. For the day in which you eat from it, you will surely die. But she said, she added the word touch. And so what happens when she added to God's word created the place in which the lie can come in. The first mistake is she gave attention. When she gave attention, gave his presence purpose, gave his voice purpose. The next mistake is when she added to. In other words, when she added to, now that lie can come in right there. And that lie is to distort, pervert. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, For as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Follow with me in this train of thought. For as you think... So you are. So your state of being is dependent upon the meditation of your heart. That word think in Proverbs 23 verse 7, one of the definitions of it is it means gatekeeper. So in other words, your mind is a gateway and your thoughts are to function as a gatekeeper to the gateway of your mind. But for most people, their thoughts will act, actually function as a door greeter than a gatekeeper. The main avenue that the devil is looking for in your life is the avenue of your mind, the, the, the battlefield of your mind, and he's trying to come against that point. But if you don't fill your mind with God's truth, what happens, the moment she added to God's word, she opened the gate. Is this helping? And I have three minutes. Follow with me just for a minute. Satan speaks a lie and the purpose, so what he does, he doesn't try to come all on you all at once. What he does is he speaks a word and when that word comes into your heart and into your mind, that word begins to form a structure within the soul called a stronghold. And so he allows that word to lay, sit there long enough until a structure is formed so that now his presence can, can, can come and occupy that place in the soul. In other words, Satan will speak these little lies to you and you'll come into agreement with that lie and that lie makes it feel like you're in control until he's in control. 
And what that lie is doing is it's forming a structure in the soul called a stronghold. Matter of fact, to illustrate this point, turn with me just real quickly to John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, this is when Judas betrayed Jesus, but I want you to see something here. In John chapter 13, it gives us a description of how the enemy does this. In John chapter 13, 1 and 2, it says this, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he would depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Listen to this. And supper being ended, listen to this, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. So what did he do? He had already put into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Right? In other words, he came with this lie. He came with this philosophy. He came with this idea. He came with this worldview. Follow me? And the whole time that this, this was in Judas's heart, and the whole time is creating the stronghold that he doesn't know is being created. And then when you hop all the way down to verse 26 and verse 27, you see the point in which Satan's presence fully occupies that place. This is when they're at the supper, and, one of the, and Jesus has already said, well, one of you is about to betray me. One of the disciples leans over and said, well, who is it? And then he answers with this. It is whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it, and have dipped it the bread, and, and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan then entered him. So you see this, this two-point, this, this two-function combination. The lie comes, the lie forms a structure, and then once the structure is formed, now a spirit occupies that structure. So now the belief system itself becomes demonically empowered. And now in order for you to think different, you first need a deliverance. Well, William, I'm a Christian, I, I can't have a demon. Well, you have to understand, it is your spirit that became a new creation. It is your spirit that's become one with God. And it is your spirit that's made perfect and holy. It is your spirit that is sealed. And so it's your spirit that cannot be penetrated by a demonic spirit, but your soul can be inhabited by a demonic spirit. Your mind and your heart and emotions can have a stronghold in there. And that's exactly what's happening to a lot of believers. And they have these lies that's created these strongholds strongholds and now these spirits have occupied it and it's creating this prison in the soul Man, I wish I had time to lay this foundation I'm already one minute over and the events director is looking at me Okay. I literally think I'm going to blow up one day. I do. So this should give more purpose and meanings to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. Let's look at that, and then I'll, then I'll let the captives go here. Hold up. Let's just read 2 Corinthians 10 through 5 here. For though... For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds. Listen to this. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So what is it trying to exalt itself against? The knowledge of God. Against truth. Listen to this. Bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, not some thoughts. See, a lot of times we read this and we think, oh, this is talking about negative thinking. No, it's talking about every thought. Do you realize you're not called to think positive? You're called to think godly? You see, positive thinking will just get you to hell in a better mood. That's all positive thinking is going to do. <laughs> but we've allowed Dr. Phil to replace Jesus.
No, it says to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Why? Because structured strongholds are, are, are constructed in your life through thoughts. You sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. You sow a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. You see, there's a divine connection between what you're thinking today and what you're fulfilling tomorrow. Today's thoughts is literally the prophetic voice of tomorrow's destiny. And the same way that that stronghold was, was built is the same way it's deconstructed. It's by taking every folk captive to the obedience of Christ. What you're doing, you're destroying one stronghold and forming a new one. And this new stronghold you are forming is a stronghold of God's word. Oh. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good, perfect, and acceptable. You know what that word renew means? It means to renovate. One thing your old creation did leave behind, listen, you don't have a sin nature anymore, but one thing it left behind was old ways of thinking, memories, habits, and values that you now have to change. In other words, there was a, your soul occupied the presence of another spirit, and now you've got to renovate that soul to occupy the Holy Spirit. My wife and I just bought a, a new house. It's an older house. And everything in that house was designed for the previous owners. And so for the first month, it felt like we were living in somebody else's home. But you know what we had to start doing? We had to start renovating, remodeling that home so that it would, it would create an environment for our presence I hope somebody's getting this. When you became a born-again believer, you immediately, instantly became a new creation. But what was left behind was this old home and the soul that now you got to renovate that sucker and you got to put new pictures on the wall, not pictures of you what you used to do, but pictures of you and Jesus having a party with Christ, you and Jesus healing the sick and raising the dead and cleansing the leper, you and Jesus walking in new creation existence, you and me, Jesus. Oh. And what you're doing without realizing it is you're creating an environment, a stronghold in the soul, in which now the Spirit of God can fully occupy and manifest itself through the soul, into the flesh, through your life. I think I've given you enough to think about. But have you seen this pattern, deception and temptation? What gives purpose to deception is ignorance of truth. What gives purpose to temptation is my agreement when he projects these things. I come into agreement with it, then I empower it. Before I came up, my wife leaned over. She said, I feel like I have a, have a word for, for the people. But before I allow her to, to share this word, there's two things I want to mention about my wife. About six years ago, she had this encounter with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit where she went out for 12 hours. I know I'm the one who had to carry her around for 12 hours. And over the course of these 12 hours, she began to vibrate. She began to shake under the power of the Holy Spirit. But ever since that encounter, now when the Spirit moves on her, she still shakes just, just a little bit. And now there's also a shout that comes out. I don't understand it. I don't know how to explain it, but the only thing I know this. Ever since this experience or this encounter, more people get saved, more people get healed, more people get delivered than any other time before we ever seen this experience. 
But I want to preface it this way. What she is functioning in is a sovereign thing that God is doing specifically with her. It is not something that we are role modeling for you to use as a model of ministry. So if you see the Holy Spirit using my wife in a particular way, you can't just go home and start acting like that and thinking it's going to produce the same thing. You hear me? But the reason I'm preferencing it this way, because I don't want you to focus on a manifestation and miss the message. I want you to receive the word. So, babe. Good evening, family. Good evening, family. I, I kept hearing the father singing over you. Yeah. And I also felt like there were people that felt like they were ready to give up. They didn't want to keep going on anymore, whether it would be in ministry or whatever they're doing. I also felt like there was this, 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 this hopelessness. And I also wanted to pray over the ones that are dealing with addiction. Um, and if you feel the Holy Spirit moving on you, I just want you to stand so we can pray for you. Take courage, your heart. Stay steadfast, your soul is in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Take courage, your heart. Stay steadfast, your soul is in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Do not grow weary in doing good for in due time you shall reap the harvest if you do not give up so with every person that has been feeling like they are ready to give up i speak courage i speak strength I speak grace to continue on in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. William, would you pray over their minds? For every person that's standing right now, I just want you to close your eyes and just hold your hands like you're receiving a gift. The Holy Spirit's just moving over many of you. This young lady here in the red, the Spirit of the Lord is all over you right now. I bless what the Spirit of the Lord is doing. I ask that he would come with more power right now. Right now. There it is. There it is. There it is. Someone get around that young lady. More Holy Spirit, power of God, come. There it is. More. <laughs> this young lady right here in the green, the Spirit of the Lord is all over you. I just bless what the Holy Spirit is doing. I just call out destiny. I just call out value right now. There it is. There it is. There it is. Pull more Holy Spirit. More Holy Spirit. There it is. Just keep receiving. I just speak over every person's mind and heart right now where there have been lies, where there's been false beliefs, where there's been philosophies, ideas that, that are, are holding them back. I break off those bondages now in the name of Jesus. I break off those strongholds in the name of Jesus. I command new forms of thought to be formed, new pathways of thinking to be formed in their mind right now. More Holy Spirit. This young lady right here, the Spirit of the Lord is all over you. Fill her up, fill her up, fill her up, fill her up, fill her up. I'm not addressing the church, I'm just praying in the spirit for a moment. There's this young lady right here, right in front of me. The spirit of the Lord is touching you powerfully. I bless what the Holy Spirit is doing. Freedom. Come to the heart. Freedom, come to the mind right now. Freedom, come to the heart. Freedom, come to the mind right now. In Jesus' name, every stronghold broken. Every stronghold broken. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Shh. This young lady right here, the Spirit of the Lord is all over you. Power of God, come right now. There it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Power of God, come. Shh. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. See, there's, there's freedom in this room. There's freedom in this place. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to teach you a prayer that I pray over my mind every single night before I go to sleep. And there's two things I do before I go to sleep. 
I always direct my heart and my attention to Jesus, and then I lay hands on myself, and I pray over my mind, and this is what I pray. I want you to say this with me. Lord Jesus, I ask that your blood sanctify my mind, sanctify my emotions according to your truth, in Jesus' name. And then I go to sleep. No, I'm telling you, that's what I do. <laughs> you need to tell yourself, go to sleep, and go to sleep. This is what I found. Listen, family, and I, then I'll let you go in just a moment. But this is what I found. When I do this, not only do I go to sleep, I actually rest. Because what the enemy wants to do is you become emotionally weakened so that you're not able to resist. Because many of us sleep, but not many of us rest. I sleep eight hours every day, have been for years. So I just bless the sleep and the rest in this room right now. I just declare freedom from nightmares in Jesus. Matter of fact, somebody here, you've been dealing with nightmares. Just wave a hand if that was you. You've been dealing with nightmares. I just break off those nightmares in the name of Jesus. No more. No more. Yeah. Just let the truth of God's word just bring that peace, bring that comfort. See, the Lord is bringing our soul to a place of peace right now. I can feel it in the room. Can you feel it? A place of wholeness, a place of rest, a place of surrender, a place of peace. Family, when you go home tonight, when you go home this week, I encourage you to get in the Word of God. Allow the Word to become the foundation that your encounter can be built upon. Because experiences come and go, but the Word of God, it's there. I value my encounter. But if I solely based my life only on that, I don't know where I would be at today. I know friends that had similar encounters to me within two years are right back in the same bondage. Why? They didn't get the word of God inside of them. 